I'm going to go ahead and start our recording of this wonderful thing as we wait for people to come in and say hi. And as I try this one last time to share this to Facebook, this is going to be the last time I try it though. Um, and then we will go ahead and get started. All sorts of thoughts. Yeah, I'm just seeing your not now mug. <laughs> it is from Square One Goods here in Birmingham, gifted by my wonderful friends at Create Birmingham. Nice. But it's yes now. Is it though? <laughs> Jessica says you're welcome. You're so wonderful. Uh, I really want to share to a page I manage, but if this will only go to my timeline. I may just go there. Okay. Which is not what I would prefer to do, but it's okay. Is it the way you're logged in on Facebook? No, it's supposed to be able to do both, but it's okay. okay. Um, what I'm going to ask Jessica to do is if she's in a position to share this to the create page, that would be wonderful. And we've got Meg joining in too. Oh. All right. And so that says preparing. So we're going to go ahead and get started because as I say at the beginning of all of these, it is so important to me to honor people's time. Um, and if we don't start on time, we can't finish on time. So for everyone who is here, welcome so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate you taking time to join us. Uh, my name is Jackie Jones. I am Community Engagement Manager for Create Birmingham. I also own a marketing firm called One Degree Marketing. And today is another episode, uh, so to speak, of our series of community conversations. And we normally will do this uh, community conversations in person uh, within communities, having conversations about those communities. And if this is your first time joining us, this is just a virtual extension of that. Our chance to talk and speak with different people about different things that maybe our small businesses or entrepreneurs or creators or makers, artists are facing uh, different things they can think about and maybe different perspectives that they should be taking. So today I have the great honor of having with me Miss Autumn Sanders Foster, which I love her so much. So this is like chatting with a friend for me. Um, but as I do everyone, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Sure. So I am Autumn Sanders Foster with Quire Consulting. Um, you can find us at qireconsulting.com. And we are a firm that specializes in helping organizations figure out what comes next. And we do that through primarily through research. So we want to help our customers understand their, our, help our clients understand their customers, understand themselves, and then make the next best decision um, based on that research and that information. So I'm excited to be here to talk to you guys about how you can do that with your businesses. How do you understand your customers as your customers are trying to understand themselves and that definition of who they are and how they are is constantly changing. I mean, even now we're talking about reopening the economy and what does that mean? And so everybody's reality is, is on the cusp of shifting yet again um and so as much as we want to say not now uh we don't have to um, and so i'm not sharing my opinion on that yeah so there's always time for us to understand our customers because our customers um continue continue to change well thank you so much for being here um and we'll get into a little bit more detail about what you do i see that jessica said that it's not popping up on facebook that's because it still says preparing and not saying posting oh. yet that's okay. So you're not seeing it because it's not happening yet. Um, and yeah, so <laughs> hopefully at some point it will show up on Facebook. If it does not, we will, I'll be okay. Um, so I want to first kind of put some, just kind of give this a 
starting point. Help us understand, because of course, when you say words like research as small business owners or as makers, as creators, even as people who are in organizations, um, research is one of those words we don't really like. Let's just be honest. Um, research is hard. It is time consuming and it comes with just a whole skill set that most people just genuinely don't have. Um, and that's normal. That's why it's the whole science. Um, but what I want to start with today is, is kind of give us an idea of what you do, what your firm does for the organizations that you work with. Like what are the, what's the kind of core result that you're often after? Sure. So we work with a lot of organizations that are at some point of change, whether it's they are looking to hire a new executive director, they want to launch a strategic plan process, planning process, um, looking at what's going to come up in the next few years. We've worked with organizations that are launching new programs or new services. And so we are best suited to come in with an organization that's kind of in this you know, state of flux. Maybe they've started something, maybe they have an idea that they haven't started, and they're trying to figure out what's the best way to respond. Or they've got a, a problem or a challenge, and they're figuring out how to adjust. And so we come along our, beside our clients, and we do secondary research, which is uh, talking to um, experts or doing data research online or using secondary sources where we're not the ones doing the interviews, but we're collecting other folks' information um, to kind of understand the lay of the land, what's going on in the world that, that our clients need to understand in order to be able to flesh out that program or service or product that they want to launch. Um, we also do internal research with the client themselves. So we do interviews with the primary team that's working on the project. We do interviews with their key, if it's a nonprofit, maybe it's with their funders or their board members um, to kind of understand what's the, what's the climate that everybody's operating in trying to make this decision. So what's, what's the state of the state and what's the state of the team? And then we also do research with customers. So if something is being launched, um, if there's an audience in mind, we try to help our, our clients understand if that's the right audience. There's a term in the industry that's called product market fit, which usually means you're trying to find the audience for the thing that you've created. Mm -hmm. But we think that you've got to understand the audience so that you can create the thing that they actually need, want, and value. And so if you create the thing without the audience, you have, you're, you're, you're constantly missing each other. But if you understand the audience and lean in there first, then when you create, you already know what you're trying to achieve. You already know the standard that you're trying to reach or the, the environment that you're trying to deliver that program, product, or service into. And so we, um, you know, we help organizations, all types of organizations. Um, I did this work before I came to Birmingham and we worked with some big name corporations that you would know, um, folks that are still open in this economy and doing quite well. Um, but we also worked with, you know, small companies and, and, and startups and, and just folks across the landscape who knew they had a problem and knew that they needed a partner to help them help them solve it. And, you know, I, it's such a good point about how we have to follow what the audience wants, what they need, yes. not necessarily just try to force feed them our, our idea or what we have decided is the solution. Um, and that's something that in all, all, all the programs that Create Birmingham offers, we are constantly trying to help people figure out new ways to talk to their audience, talk to their customers, talk to whoever's on the receiving end to make sure you are not shooting over their head or yeah. under them or beside them or whatever. Yeah. Um, so and it's something really that we do in regular life. Like this yeah. is not an, a new idea or a new thought, no, right? Like not. if you are the best chef, but your child will only eat white foods, what do you figure out how to do? Make white foods that your child will eat, right? Yeah. And so the I same like thing it. goes with grownups. Grownups are just big kids. Like they have habits and behaviors and needs and things that they want and things that they don't want. Um, and they've got ways that we have to respond to. And so um, it's, it's frustrating if you are an amazing chef and nobody eats your food. But 
if you make food that people will eat, um, that meets your standards and, and uses your capabilities as a chef, um, it's, it's the same thing. It's the exact same thing. So help us understand, you know, of course, we should all hire choir consulting. Um, that's my disclaimer before I ask a lot of these questions because I'm gonna be asking you to give us a little bit of the game yeah. here. <laughs> um, help us understand for those of us who are offering anything, product service, art, music, um, just whatever we're giving to the world, help us understand what is the first step? Like where, when you're talking to a customer or client about better understanding their audience, What's that kind of first step of how you prepare to go about that and how you decide how you will go about that? So one of the really important things that's in, that we have to understand with working with a client is are they able, willing to make change? Mm -hmm. If the client has a point of view and they will not be deterred from that point of view, they may not be the best client for, for us. Because there is no room for the data to affect their organization. If they've, if they've crossed the I, they've dotted the T, they just want to know, should it be purple or red? That's not us. You know, we, we need to help you. We need to know, do we have the leeway to help inform how the organization operates, what, the, what, change, what can change about the thing? So I would say, as, as if I have my client hat on, um, the first thing to kind of understand about yourself and your organization is what's the room for change? Mm. Are you so wedded to the business plan you wrote in college? Are you so wedded to the Ooh. thing that was successful three months ago and we're not living in the world we were living in three months ago? Not at all. Um, are you so wedded to all of these things that your margin for change is so small? Um, then you've got to look at where can you op open up that margin for change. Um, wow. We also look at... <laughs> That's a tall order. I just want <laughs> just asking people to relinquish the, the just hold they have on that original dream or that original way of going about it can be so much. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's a lot. Carry on. Well, I'll say that we have clients who maybe if you look at, if we're looking, working with a large organization, and there might be five stakeholders on the team. All five of them may have a different idea of what the company should be doing and how. True. So you may have one person with a margin for change that the other person doesn't have, but you all need a margin of change because none of you are saying the same thing, right? Um, so that it's a it's a big deal. But the, the key is if it were working, you would be working. And it's not working. And it may not be. It's, it's nobody's fault. If it's not working, it's just, it's just the experiment. It's just the test. You prototype that thing. You did as best you could. It's not working. You move on. Same thing. Like that's how I feel about our Facebook Live right now. Right. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's, that's, that's nobody's fault. That's technology. I know. It's like, eh, it's technology. We'll right. We keep going. Try again so, another day. You know, it's, it's not a value judgment mm -hmm. if you have to shift. And it's so... Not, does that mean that there has to be some separation of, because of course, as, as a, the person who is providing the thing, there is a personal connection to what you're doing, and oh, yeah. which is why we try to force feed people the thing we want them to have is because yeah. we're like, look, I believe in this thing. And so there has to be some separation of what's best for the business or what's best for the future yeah. in general and what you are holding on to. Um, and so how do you, so question um, there, just while we're right there, how do you help your clients separate that? Like what ways do you really go about, you know, is there any exercise? Cause I, I'm, you know, I wondered this as a business owner, mm -hmm. it's hard to make those calls when you're yeah. like, let me stop being emotional. Um, but that's how we are. So is yeah. what can we do to separate and see clearer and kind of increase that margin for change? I would say that's why consultants are helpful. Um, one, because we don't have a dog in the fight. Like mm -hmm. we get we get paid whether or not you agree with our recommendations <laughs> or not, whether you roll it out or not. Um, but but someone someone outside of your space can help you ask those big questions 
your mom may not be able to ask you those big questions. Your spouse may not be able to ask you those big questions because they care about you. They care about your success. And sometimes you might have to do something that's harder before, it, before it's easier or cost you money before it makes you money, right? And so, um, you know, there's, there's, those, there's that separation. I would say kind of go, if you are so wedded to what you're doing, go back to what you're doing and why. Like, just have that kind of sit down with yourself of, of what's your motivation? Why are you doing this? How much of that has to happen now? How much of that can happen later? We had to do that with choir because when we launched, there were very few organizations who knew what design thinking was or human-centered design. And that's the core of our methodology. And so if I was, if I was gonna start this firm and say, we are a human center design firm and we do design thinking, you need to buy that from us. We would have no business, right? right. And so we had to do projects and build relationships. So for one client that meant running a name storming session or leading an RFP process that wasn't in line with our mission as an organization, but it gave us the relationship. So when that strategic planning and that research opportunity that was in line with who we are came up, we were able to be first in line to take advantage of that. Um, and so I would say, just look at what you want to, to do. Look at, look at what's important to you and put it on a timeline. When does that have to be true? It's not never, but it may not be right now. So we have to understand ourselves a little bit before we can work on understanding our audience. Yes, yes. So. Um. <laughs> so very very deep and so those things happen simultaneously yeah um and in a more practical way so so let's say that i'm just going to kind of walk through this process yeah, right so yeah. let's say as a business owner um or just as a person i've decided okay i am open and willing to let my audience lead me mm -hmm. now the question is what am I after? What am I trying to learn? Because if they're leading me, I guess I have to identify a problem. So what's the next step? Yes. So one of the next steps is really understanding who, you're, who you want your audience to be. So we might think we have an idea of who our audience is. Um, or we might say, I'm just, I just want to talk to the people who will talk to me. So we go to our friends or we go to our Facebook page or we put something out on Instagram. But those, again, those are folks who, who care about you and your yeah. success. And so their feedback to you will be influenced by you and your success. So I would say, think about who you want your audience to be um, and work on trying to understand them as people first. So before your product or your service or your business comes into play, have an idea of who they are that comes from them. So um, where can you say where your customer shops? Um, where do they live? How do they spend their free time? What's the largest purchase they're gonna make this year? What's the splurge that they like to buy occasionally? Um, how do they relax? What, what's important to them about their family life or their, their partnered life? Or do they have pets in the home? If you can come through research with a 360 view of who your person is, mm -hmm. um, then that gives you an idea of where you need to either level up or level down. Right? If, if your audience is, you know, this, this is Birmingham, so, you know, Mountain Brook Mom. Okay, so that there's a level of quality that she expects. It's gonna guide your marketing on where you're gonna advertise. It's gonna um, guide who, what the product is gonna look like. What does it need to, to appear on shelf with? Like if you're doing a cosmetic line, she might have some cosmetics that she's already loving. So can your cosmetic sit on the bathroom counter next to the things that she already purchased? Does it look like it belongs? If not, you've got to change your packaging, right? And so when you understand your audience, then anything you do around your product or service is a test of that assumption. It's a test of that, of that understanding. Um, if you put your product in front of them first and you treat them like a customer rather than a person, then it's just, it's just a shooting in the dark. 
But if you understand where you're trying to go, it's kind of narrowing in your target. It helps you focus a little bit more. And so you got a little bit into what kind of my next uh, question is really about, which is how do you break beyond that circle of people that you already know that's already your amen corner? Because that's I know even in a marketing world, that's the, the thing that everybody's trying to do, break beyond their, you know, already reach of things. Yeah. So when you're trying to better understand people who won't just high why five you these days but yeah. i five you and say hey yeah you're awesome this is great of course i want it of course it's wonderful and give you true data how do you break beyond that like what what types of options do you have yeah doing that? so i'd say um you've got you've got the agnostic option which is hiring out right and again the reasons to do that is because they are agnostic and so there is a level of transparency and honesty that someone can have with a stranger that they may not be able to say to your face or you know why do you want to know um or you're too invested or you might ask leading questions so hiring a consultant kind of gives you some structure and gives you some separation i would say if you are not at that point yet and not everybody is um use the people you know to get to the people that you don't know mm -hmm. so if you have an idea of who your audience or who your customer is um, and I would say, be aware that so your customer may not be your buyer, right? So if, if you're talking to school teachers, but the teacher's not the one making the purchase, it's the principal or the school administrator making the purchase, you know, kind of have that, have that in mind. And so use the people you know, like say, hey, college roommate who lives in another state, I've got this idea, or I want to ask these questions. Can you share this with your network? Hey, sorority sister, can you share this with your network? Hey, um, church member, can you share this with your network? And so they can get to the people that you may not be able to access. The other thing I would say is it, don't be afraid to treat that relationship more formally. Um, mm -hmm. They're not just doing you a favor, they're helping you in your business. And if you actually want real help, good help, Maybe it's that you don't send it through 40 people or everybody in your email list. Maybe you pick 10 and say, hey, I need your help in this. This is how I need you to help me. If you're willing to help me in this way, this is what I need you to do. And spell out what that engagement will look like. And maybe you don't get 40 people to respond, but you get 10 people to act on your behalf and their agency is much better than half half-hearted responses from 40. Like I keep I keep talking about your mom. Like I love, I love my mother. My mother is amazing. When I talk about what I do, she's just like, tell me what it is you're working on. Again. What are you doing? Do you do? like like she just doesn't get it. So her help for me looks very different yeah. than a former colleague, looks very different than someone who's a peer in the industry. And so, you know, knowing how people can help you and help, helping people help you to their best advantage while preserving that relationship is really important. That is extremely important. Very funny because I feel like my mother felt that way for a long time. She was like, so, cause she would always offer suggestions oh, yeah. that weren't quite in line. And I'm just like, do you understand what I'm doing? <laughs> and I, mean, I, got a, I got a master's degree. I, I went to school for this and I, and she's just like, so proud. Cannot tell anybody. What <laughs> But she loves you and she But she loves me. She loves me. If I need cake made, she's the first in line. So Man, let's not get into that because then I'll get I'll get back. <laughs> um so so just to kind of, you know, for everyone who is here with us and, and watching, so I need to first understand myself and the level the margin of change that I truly have um, for, mo for moving forward. And then if I'm going to attempt this, you know, kind of organically on my own at first, um, I should identify the people who are, one, are there people I can directly touch that will not just Wi-Fi me um, and say, yes, you're great and awesome and this is a wonderful idea. Or if there are people who can strategically help me being able to empower them enough to yes. take my message forward, hopefully to the right people. Yes, and that comes from knowing your audience and being able to communicate that audience to them. So if you're asking someone to act on your behalf, maybe you want to spell out, here's the type of person that I'm, I'm looking at. And one of the things I'll say is a lot of times we get stuck on the demographics, like this is a 
you know, a mom whose kids are teenagers and she's between 45 and 55 and, or whatever. Yeah. And we get stuck there. Yeah. But it's those um, descriptors. Psychographics. Yeah. The, the psychographics, yeah, to, to use a big word. Um, where, where does she, she loves natural parks. Um, she's been to Essence Festival three times. Um, she carries her recycled bags into the grocery store. Um, no one remembers her natural hair color. Like whatever it is, like those are the things that like, I know who you're talking about. That's, that's the lady down the street or that's the person in the carpool line ahead of me or whatever it is. It's those things that help people get to someone that they know. Okay, so I'm in, in 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 kind of a. I feel like every conversation we do, I'm like being so selfish, but I feel like I'm in the space of everyone who is listening. Um, so I am building this, let's say, email right to my ten strategic people, and I'm like, here, I'm going to give them a definition of the people I'm after. That's kind of where we are now, and then the question then is, is how do I want? Like, what are they sharing? So, what are then the tools of? Is it a survey? Is it a a web page is it a like where how do I gather that because of course I'm not necessarily asking them to maybe hold full interviews for me right, yeah. um, but I do want them to get their attention for me but where where should I be leading them to start better understanding and asking the right questions well I say there's a lot of different ways that you can engage like when I started doing this Instagram wasn't a thing um, and so I think there's a there's a lot more qualitative data at our fingertips mm -hmm. than a survey um, surveys are probably like the least fun way of getting someone to participate with you. And when there's money involved, and then it's so fun. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so you have, to, you have to see what is it you're trying to learn. That's the biggest question. Are you trying to understand, like I'll, I'll use COVID-19 as an example, right? If one of the big changes for COVID-19 are people's buying habits. So people who may have been occasional online shoppers are like old pros at it now. Like you've got six-year-olds using Zoom, right? You have six-year-olds doing right. video chat, which did not happen four weeks ago, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you, when you know, say, say your question is, I want to understand how um, their buy, online buying habits have changed, right? Because maybe you're interested in this economy and launching an online store or an online service. And so instead of sending them a survey, like how frequently do you go online? Well, everybody's online all the time. That, that, that question doesn't make any sense anymore. Right. But what you can say is take a screenshot of your last five online purchases. What are the last five things you bought this week? Why did you buy it? Was this an intended purchase? What excited you about that experience? What would you have changed about that experience? And now you're asking them about something that they've done. We find that people are much better at talking about what they've already done than what they will do. Because mm. you know, we all, we all uh, think that tomorrow will be better or tomorrow will do better or tomorrow will do different, but you can't change what you've already done. Um, and so asking them to show you what they've done or talk about those things um, is, is a, it's a safer, it's a safer subject. Um, it's a more honest subject and you'll, you'll get better information that you can actually, that you can actually use. So here's a hard question. And I say it's hard because I know that, um, you know, from a mark, from a marketing perspective and from an entrepreneurial perspective, it can be, it's easier to do this for business, right? For my service or my product? What if I'm a maker? What if I am an art, like a music artist? Or like, how do I, and I, I know this because oftentimes I have a really close friend who is like, I want to put out, you know, the kind of music that resonates with people a certain kind of way, which is odd to hear people say in a creative space because usually they create and they just attract the people who are attracted to it. But if you've been doing that and you feel like, oh, but nobody's buying, nobody is doing the thing, you find yourself in the same situation as a business owner, which is where am I missing people here? Is it the, is it the actual thing I've created or is it how I'm presenting it? So how would I, in a very non, would you buy it way, engage an audience? Yeah. Oh, okay. So creative space is really interesting. <laughs> it's, it's really interesting because I think that 
creatives are least inclined to change because mm. everything says something about them and who they I'm sorry, are. Sorry, y'all. She doesn't mean that. <laughs> I, I, went to the Southern Southern Baptist Church. I went to where they say if you can't say man say ouch <laughs> and I, I mean no disrespect I mean no disrespect I've got artists yeah. in my family I went to I went to art school like I've, I've seen this lived out um let me not speak in absolute self that's that's fair <laughs> so I think that sometimes artists can apply a, a personal decision we can all do this. You can make a personal decision out of a business decision. Absolutely. And so you can say, oh, I don't like technology, so I'm not going to sell my stuff online. I Which like is a vinyl. real thing for and a lot so, of people. Like the only pure sound for my music is vinyl. So that's the only, mm -hmm. well, you just narrowed your audience to the people who have record players. Despite what it. their musical preferences are. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so I think what you have to look at are what are the levers that are accessible to you? What, what like, you don't want to change the song. You don't want to crowdsource a song. Like, that's not, that's not music. That's not art. That's not why you got in the business. Fine. Okay. But what are some other pieces that you, other levers that you can pull that, that, are open or do need audience input, whether it's um, frequency of release, whether it's distribution method, whether it's um, art, whether it's under, understanding people's listening habits is really interesting. So my, my sister has two young kids and whenever I, I have no kids, so whenever I hear something great, I'm like, oh, you should hear this, you should watch this, she's like, can I listen to it with kids in the car? Okay, well, if it's not on kids, but I'm not going to listen to it. Because you should have said a period in her life. Yeah. Loves music. Her husband is a musician, has a music degree. Doesn't matter because that's just not where she is, right? Yeah. And, and so, her. right. And so, when you understand your audience and where they are in their life and what they're doing and what their habits are and what are the things that, that surround their ability to engage with your creative product, um, then that, that helps you adjust. Because if your audience is that, you know, family member looking for that downtime, like maybe your, your raw and uncut live album isn't the album that needs to be distributed. Maybe mm -hmm. there's a studio version of that that they can listen to in the car with the kids. But that show is that show that they will always get, right? Yeah. And so you just have to figure out where your audience can give input and can give feedback. And so I feel like I'm hearing, so sometimes understanding your audience is not necessarily at, with the end of changing what you're offering, but maybe it gives you options um, okay, or yeah, maybe yeah. It, it determines. And so I really like the way you phrase like, which, what other levers can you pull um, when, when something or some piece of it needs to remain pure. So when you think about art or, um, and really even in product, you know, or in service, if I say, no, nope, I, this is the service I know really well, this is what I know how to do. It's like, I would love to change it for everyone, but I don't know how to do that. Um, so you kind of can't change the thing, but you definitely can change the way. So I, I really yeah. like the way that you phrased what other, you know, levers can you pull? So let's, let's say that and if people have questions, I just want to remind you that there is a Q&A feature if you would like to do that and I will get to them as, you know, they pop in or you can use the chat box, which is completely fine as well. Um, so what do you say to, so let's say that now, um, something is attacking my eye. Um, let's say that now, you know, I've kind of gotten a few good referrals from people who I've strategically put in place to help me better understand. I have, you know, gotten enough information to know, hey, I have a couple people I can really talk to. Let's talk about what my conversation with the right people should look like. Yes. Um, you know, how do I ask the questions that don't, you know, get me yes and another pat on the back, which puts me back at square one. Yeah. So again, I would say a consultant is helpful in this because a consultant doesn't have a dog in the fight. Right. When people know they're sitting down and having a conversation with the owner, the founder, the person who eats off of what I'm about to say, yeah. that's, that's a tension that you can't, you can't resolve. And as much as you say, 
you can be honest with me, tell me the truth. Again, you know, that's why having that conversation with people that are you're close to can be difficult. You have to kind of move an, far enough away um, for them to really be able to engage with you. And to add a, a colleague who, you know, she was, she was doing, following this research protocol and she, you know, people would look her up. She would, she would try to create that distance, but she's the founder. And so people like, oh yeah, I looked you up. And so they would see her, her pitch deck. They would see her, her Vimeo video, her YouTube video talking about what she's doing. You know, they would see the profile written about her. And so, you know, because you're the founder and your name is out there and your identity is out there associated with your product or your organization, it's really hard to kind of create that distance. So that said, when you find yourself in that situation and you, you, you are just in that place where you have to take this on yourself, I would say the, the key is to give people um, ways to engage rather than creating questions to ask. Hmm. So um, show me, tell me is really helpful. Like if you're in someone's home or with on their business or even we're, we're in video. So um, do you mind doing this on your phone? So walk me around your bathroom. Walk me around your office space. Show me, show me, show me, show me, show me, and then have a conversation about them and their things. So you're not in a position where you're selling or you're talking into them, but you're creating opportunities for them to share about their life, their experiences, their habits, beliefs, values, and needs. Um, that's, that's the biggest um, way to bridge that gap and, um, and, and still, create, still create a distance. And, that, and that's a wonderful thing. And you know, the, what you were just saying about kind of show me around a space, this is actually a wonderful time to do that because everybody is on their phone doing video stuff. And if there's a question and even I, you know, I think about, I immediately think about an artist with something to hang on a wall. Um, to say, you know, if you are a person who loves art, but your wall looks like, let's say, Autumn's wall that has, it's you know, a working wall. Notes and like, it's not necessarily not for art, but it's not for art, it's for work. Um, but you love art, it's like, okay, how do I help, you know, try to find a balance in this? And maybe there's other spaces in the home and that kind of thing. And just recognizing that I'm not creating something that goes in a certain space. Um, yes, I just picked on you and your mini sticky notes. I just want to point that out. Uh, <laughs> uh, someone said they've been coveting uh, your wall. <laughs> okay, let me just say. Um, so it, there's actually a great question in the sure. chat. What were you about to say? I say it's butcher paper. It's, oh, see? see? Don't take the teacher supplies. They're going to need those <laughs> when the children go back to school. Um, okay, so a really, really good question. Um, so in, in the lane of where we just were is, um, how do you share enough about your idea when... Um, and when is a non-disclosure needed? So if I have, you know, top secret information here, or I'm sharing something maybe I haven't begun yet, or I'm seeking to understand better, mm. how, how do I do that? And at what point do I just need to say, hey, before we start, sign here? Yeah. So I would say, one, look at what's the conversation that you're intending to have. You may be able to have a great interview experience with someone and get great user data without it being direct feedback on your idea. Uh, and so that's why we said, if you understand the audience and their experience and their values and needs and you create an environment for them to share with you, um, you limit that, that legal need. Um, I will say that whenever a non-disclosure or a legal agreement is entered into the conversation, um, People get a little, whoa, what do you, you know, what is all of this, right? And so you want to figure out how far you can get and how much information can you get without having to do that. I will say if you are doing any sort of photography, if you're doing any sort of recording, then you want to actually tell them up front before the interview starts that those things are taking place. You want to let them know how those things will be used. This is research. This is not marketing footage. If you want to use a quote from them, you'll go back and get their permission for that. So you want to, so in that way, those parameters give them the permission to speak freely, to be safe with you, and to know that you're not going to misuse the information that they give to you. Um, I'd say when you are at a point, 
So if you've done your upfront work, you understand your audience, you understand their needs and their values, you have that from primary data and not just, well, this is what I think the problem is because this is the problem that I had, or this is the problem because this is what my, my mother told me. Um, but when you've got that from data and you are in a position, because we do work to a position where we're able to share an idea or a product or service with someone, um, then I would say one of the things that you want to control, um, I think the NDA is important. Let them know what the parameters are, what the ramifications are. I would say this is where your lawyer friends come in handy. Hire someone, pay for someone to create an NDA um, that is clear and kind. Um, I'd say one of the things that's helpful is to move that out of your typical legal document format. Put it on your letterhead, give it some design weight, make it look less intimidating and less legal than a traditional legal document. Same content, but just adjust the form. Um, then once you have that signed, then you can go ahead and share about your idea. I, I will say, um, I caution against that being your lead horse because you're not trapped yeses and no's. Those yeses and no's have very little value if that's not your target customer. Um, if you don't know what you need to know about their environment and how that will fit into, um, fit into their space. Um, the other thing I would say is be careful about what you share. Um, I wouldn't email anything that you're worried about protecting. Um, so if you, especially not a Word document, because everybody has word and everybody can change everything, right? And so if there is something that you want to share with them, do a video chat, share your screen. But at the end of the time that you have with them, they don't have anything physical to talk about your idea. So, so, so even if you have an NDA, you want to take appropriate precautions for, for your- You want to make it hard idea. for them to take your idea. Yeah. Which and so, but what I'm what I feel like I'm hearing from you is that this could be two separate approaches. There is the primary, I'm having a conversation around understanding, and once I've kind of narrowed down the who and the how and all of that, then maybe the conversation becomes actually about the thing, and maybe that's where an NDA becomes necessary right. if you want to get into the details of what you're offering. Um, but there is definitely, like you said, front end work to be done before you get to saying what it is. Because um, you definitely want to avoid, and this is me putting my co-starters facilitator hat on, um, you want to avoid saying, hey, I have these mugs. Do you want to buy it? <laughs> or, right. yeah, you know, and so if you're not actually saying the product or the service um, or even the organization, but just really seeking to understand the people and how they are and what they value, um, that may not even come up. So I definitely agree with that. That's a that really good example. Question. If you say... Show me around your kitchen cabinets. You know, what's the mug that means the most to you? Where do you store your mugs? Who uses mugs in your family? And you open their cabinet and they've got, you know, four mugs that were wedding gifts and they don't have any other mugs. Then that's not your audience. So the non-disclosure doesn't matter. You don't have to tell them about your mug idea. Um, well, I don't have to tell them about my <laughs> under cabinet mug holder. Not at all. That's not them. That's not them. So you can have a completely different experience. Um, without bringing an, uh, an NDA into it. A really good example. You're so quick on your feet. This is why I love you. All right. That's a great, great question. And that came from, I don't know what the J stands for, uh, Porter. Porter J. Oh, wait. Uh -huh. If I read the right way, Porter J. Foster. <laughs> that'll make way more sense. Um, okay, so are there any other questions? Um, do, don't let us stop you again. Feel free to bring those in. Um, I'm going to continue with what I have on my mind. Um, so, and again, in my mind, um, you know, when I think about services period, I always think about the process, right? So I keep starting from the beginning and building to it. So I have relinquished all of my, it has to go my way thoughts. Yes. Um, I have identified, you know, what it is I'm trying to figure out. And then I have identified people who can help me get there. Mm -hmm. They got me some good people. We're having good conversations yeah. uh, pre-NDA at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe, you know, with NDA, depending on what my, my end goal was. Yeah. Um, now my question is, and this is something that I think a lot of people miss, and I got the opportunity to really see this done well by you um, in a project that we worked 
together on. And so this question is, how do you take what you've learned and put it in perspective so that you can actually get action items out of it. Like that is so difficult to so do, <laughs> but you do it with such finesse, which is why people pay you for it, you know, because that's what you do. But, oh. but the understanding, you know, in, I think that oftentimes as people who are in the middle of a thing, mm -hmm. we see understanding in fragments, right? Mm -hmm. We rarely pull all of our understanding together and make the puzzle, you know, show the, the landscape or whatever it's supposed to be. So how, how, what are good ways for us to, to think about how we can pull that understanding together? Um, and this could be both a technical, like organization way. Mm -hmm. um, it also could just be a, a thought process, what, whatever you want to do. So I would say the biggest favor you can do yourself is to understand what you're asking from the beginning. And so one of the things that, um, like for our research interviews, we create discussion guides. And these are not questionnaires. We don't ask every question the same way every time. This is not, a, we're not trying to create a repeatable scientific study. Um, but these are, there are topics that we want to hit and want to cover because they help us get to our goals. And so when we go back to try to understand those data, that data, we come back to what are those big questions and themes that we're trying to understand. Um, a couple of things that we always do, we always record um, transcripts. If you've ever done a transcript yourself, you know it is tedious and it's thankless work. Um, but transcripts are your best friend because you can get through a transcript much, much faster than you can get through an audio file. And so we transcribe all of our, all of our interviews. Um, there are online services, I'd say, I don't love digital services. I haven't found one that does what I needed to do as fast as I needed to do it with the accuracy that I need. Um, I'd say if you're familiar with Bulo Solutions, it's an agency here in Birmingham. Um, we've used them for transcripts before. There's also a service called rev.com, um, not .org, but rev.com that does transcripts. We've used both of them and are using both of them currently on the project that I'm on right now. Um, so I would say transcripts help you see what you're hearing. They yeah. also remind you of things that you didn't hear or maybe couldn't hear in the interview. And so um, whenever I facilitate an interaction, I'm just trying to make that thing as rich as possible and stay engaged with the person I'm talking to. And so when I get back to the transcript, I was like, oh yeah, that was her answer. Or they did say that. And like, I'm learning so much more when I read it through the second time. So I would, I would always recommend spending the money on the transcripts. Mm, um, that's a good. Your mother could probably transcribe it for you. Your teenage um, daughter I or son. A woman who doesn't know what I do. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. But if someone can listen to an audio and type on, it, on a screen. It is my mother. That's that. a way someone <laughs> can help you without you know, having to. I'm know. someone's mother. I may be offended by this. Yes. <laughs> But my mom is so good at it. Um, so again, that, that's a huge tool. You'll see my wall behind me. It's butcher paper and it's sticky notes. And so what I'm doing right now, this is what I'll do when I get off this call, is I will pull out my tablet and I will read the transcript and I will take a sticky note for the color of that person that's talking and I'll write what are the things that I heard? What are the key themes? And I'll, I'll post that out. And if I listen to two or three or read two or three interviews, I'm like, oh, I see a connection here. And then on the other, so on this board, that's when I'm starting to do my clusters of themes. So these couple quotes are coming together. Let's put that together. And so you just go through to try to understand what you heard, what you saw. If you've got pictures of things that they were showing you, you can post those on your board. Um, there's also digital tools, there's digital whiteboard services that you can subscribe to, and you can do the same thing in a, in a digital version. And if you're working with a team, um, we recommend doing that as well. Um, so because we've got a team on this project, this is just the way that I work. This is not the way that my team works, obviously, because they're not in my house with me right now. And so I'll actually take this and put this in our, our digital version so that we can all share it and access it. That's and so nice. it's this kind of constant communication between the data, your team, talking it out. And this is a process that is a little bit black box, um, but it, 
you, you, you get there when you get there. Like you cannot rush coming to insights. You can't rush coming to here's what we should do. Um, there's, there's also a phrase that we use called true but useless. Um, so there might be something that you're like, man, that was that, that, that quote was, man, I felt that in my spirit when she said that in that interview. And, oh man, that was so powerful. And then when you get back to what your client needs or what your product is or what your service becomes, it doesn't mean anything for the research. And that's okay. Like not everything that's in all of this will be in your final um I will be starting the hashtag true but useless. I just <laughs> I just feel like that applies to so many things in life right now. It's, it's like, it's, oh, you shared that headline? True but useless. It's true, but useless. <laughs> yes. And so you have to kind of met out what what matters. Yeah. Um, and so when you when you do that, you come to, you know, what are the what are the things that matter? What are the things your client needs to understand? What are the things that you need to understand? Um, what's now, what's later? Um, you, you might have a collection of insights around different areas of your customer's life or business or um, things that surprised you. One thing that we try to, to honor and respect is that something that surprises us, maybe because it surprises us, but it may not be surprised to our customer. Right. Um, and especially when you're thinking about cultural differences or, um, you know, like I, I would say anything around kids is a, a space where we can kind of fall into that. Like, oh, kids love video and sh like taking videos of themselves. That's amazing. That's fascinating. No, that's kids being kids, right? <laughs> and so we have to be careful when we're, if we're exoticizing um, you know, or otherizing people yeah. because we wouldn't want to be like, oh, black people love this or women love this. We wouldn't want people to do that to the categories that matter to us. Um, so I just say be, care be careful there. That's great, great information. And you all, I just want to give you kind of a time check. We only have about five minutes left. Um, but this has been so, so valuable because, you know, I, I feel like, um, wait, I have a question here. Let me go to the Q and A. Um, I do feel like oftentimes that we are so busy, you know, doing the work and this is true with all aspects of business or creating, um, we get so caught up in making the thing that we don't take the time to fully understand our audience or even understand how to go about doing so. Um, so Stanley asks, are there ways to effectively communicate with multiple audiences or should we really just try to lock in one? Ooh, okay. So I'd say that you typically are communicating with more than one audience. Like if you think about a television commercial, for instance, you may have a target audience, but other people are going to see it, right? right. Um, and so that's, that is okay. Like any, um, you know, think of any medicine ad everybody who doesn't have the disease is seeing it and everybody who does have the disease and they have a lot of friends who don't have it that are in there because you can't bike and climb mountains with illnesses you know like they do in the commercials so right exactly there are exactly. other people in there exactly so, so some of us we're seeing it and we're making fun of it some of us is oh, yeah that's really what i need right yeah. so you 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 can you can try to speak to a particular audience in a particular way, but most of our marketing isn't that targeted. Um, I would say focus on one until you have that one on lock. Um, and when you know how to communicate to that audience, how to get that audience to respond, when you see that audience responding and moving with you, then you're able to open up to more audiences. Like if you think about a little old school example, if you go to Facebook, Facebook started with college students in college with college emails. Like that's who it was for. It became what it is, but it didn't start with say, oh, Facebook could be for everybody. Let's talk to everybody. No, it said, this is who we are. We're going to start here. We're going to focus here. Once we've managed with this, then we can expand or we can let the medium itself take us where, where it wants to go. But I'd say, I would say focus in on for now, because what you want to do is, is again, you're making business decisions, not emotional ones. You want to be able to, you know, Jackie would 
I hope you'll co-sign this, but you want to be able to measure the effectiveness of your communication. Mm -hmm. And if you are too dispersed too fast, mm -hmm. um, it, gets, it gets hard to do that, especially if you're at the beginning of stages of the game. Well, you know, one of my favorite phrases is we can't afford to market to everyone. Um, <laughs> and so I, I think that's important to keep in perspective. Um, so I already see that so if you have to run out, you all know how I am about the time. So we were right at three o'clock. Um, and so someone was saying, great session. Thank you, Elijah, for being here. Um, and so Autumn, let me just say, this has been super, 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 super helpful um, because, you know, I think that it's so hard for us to all think about our businesses, our lives in this way, because this is not how people naturally think about going about getting the thing they love and they're passionate about to other people and, you know, putting that audience first. And that's just not, it's, it feels very counterintuitive to go, why would I want to create something and then go ask other people? It's like, actually, maybe you shouldn't have created it yet, but that's a whole other right. conversation. <laughs> um, and so thank you so very, very much. Before I wrap up and give um, some little other side things, are there any last thoughts that you'd like to share? Any final, if I had to, if you didn't take one thing from me today, please know this, any final thoughts? Research. That's, <laughs> we, like we, can always be learning from other people. And I would say your audience are your true experts. Your customers are your true experts. You have to be responsive to your audience. And so you will grow the expertise that you need to respond to your audience. But you're leaving money on the table if you are not being responsive to your audience. All right. Um and just before we go, I do want to remind everyone, um, there's a question here I'm going to tell you all in a second. Um, it won't take but a second to answer. Um, but I do want to remind you that if you are not aware of what Create Birmingham is doing throughout the weeks here, we have um, a Monday morning coffee with our program, uh, director of programs, Jessica Moody. That happens Monday mornings at 9. Um, on Tuesdays in the afternoon at 2 o'clock, we've been doing our refocus workshop um, it's a two-hour workshop to help you kind of think about how things have changed uh, with what you are doing and your idea based on all that is going on in life right now. And then on Thursday nights, we do Wine with Jessica, which is W-H-I-N-E, because we all need to let it out. But we also all need a place to let it out and then figure out how we're going to come back and rah-rah our way back into a positive space. Um, and Jessica's the best at that. Before we go, um, you can visit us at www.createbirmingham.org. Um, you can find Choir Consulting at choirconsulting.com. <laughs> and that last question was from Gary, and it's a why is Stanley so amazing? <laughs> I don't know, Gary. <laughs> Um, so thank you all for being here. Jessica just put the link to the website there, um, to both websites. You are so on top of it. Um, if there is anything that, you know, you all need to reach out to create for, please feel free to do so. There are office hours if you need to talk through some things. Um, a lot of ways that we're trying to just help people navigate. Um, and just keep in mind that's businesses, that's creatives, that's artists, that's makers. Just let us know how we can support you. Um, and thank you, Autumn, for your time and your expertise and your knowledge and this wonderfully colorful wall behind you that is so much better than a Zoom background. <laughs> I love it. I appreciate <laughs> that. All right. Well, you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Stay healthy. And we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye.